Good evening, and welcome to the Writer's Block. I'm your host, John Ronan, and as you know now, because we are in our 28th year of interviews of writers, I talk to writers and sometimes other artists about their craft, what they're doing, what they've accomplished, what they're planning for the future. As I say, sometimes other artists, if you have an idea for an artist, a writer, or sculptor, musician, actor, some other brand, we'd be glad to get your suggestions. Watch for our address at the end of the show and send in a card with your suggested artist. I also want to remind you that the Writer's Block and all the other original programming out of Cape Ann TV is a result of cable access television. It's a wonderful cultural asset for and about Cape Ann. You don't get that if you subscribe to DISH, so I want you to ignore all those ads. Stick with cable. I'm very happy to say tonight we do have a writer, a return guest, Laura Harrington, who was on the show a few years ago and is back with another successful novel. I'm going to read from the flap of her latest book, A Catalog of Birds, uh, and use that as my introduction of her. <clears throat> Laura Harrington has written dozens of plays, musicals, and operas, which have been produced in venues ranging from off-Broadway to the Houston Grand Opera. Harrington has twice won both the Massachusetts Cultural Council Award in playwriting and the Clauder Competition for Best New Play in New England. Laura, that's in Maine, by the way. Laura teaches playwriting at MIT, where she was awarded the 2009 Leviton Prize. Alice Bliss, her first novel, and about which she spoke when she appeared last on the Writer's Block, won the 2012 Massachusetts Book Award in fiction. Welcome back, Laura. Thank you so much, Very John. nice to have you. It's great to be here. Would you remind us again where you grew up and where you went to school? Um, I grew up in a small town outside of Rochester, New York, uh, Penfield, actually, which is the inspiration for my first book, Alice Bliss, um, about 50 miles from Seneca Lake and Geneva, New York, where a catalog of birds takes place. I went to college in Maine at Bowdoin, uh, was the first class of women there. And then I went on, after a couple of years of travel, I went to graduate school at, this, at City College of New York where I studied, I intended to study fiction and I ended up studying theater. You intended, to, uh, but now you've come back to fiction. Uh, I know, big, long circle after 25 years. Yeah. How did you get to uh, Cape Ann? Um, my husband and I had lived in either New York City or Cambridge for each of our graduate schools and the beginning of our career. And we'd been living in cities for about 13 years and we thought uh, maybe it was time for a change. Um, and it was also shortly after my daughter was born. So, uh. And we'd had very good friends here who rented a place on um, Eastern Point and that's how we were introduced to Cape Ann and never actually thought we could live here. Living here was kind of like, wow, that would be amazing. Um, I had grown up camping in Maine with my family um, in Small Point, which is right on the water, and David had grown up uh, going to Martha's Vineyard. So for both of us, getting to live by the ocean was uh, sort of dreamy. And how long have you been here? Twenty, okay, 27 years. No plans to leave. Oh, no, no, this is it. Not, not even when it's zero out? <laughs> no, no. Well, after, you know, something like 14 moves before we got here, this is the one. Yeah, yeah. good, good. I was struck by your description of going into fiction and then, but studying drama, now you're back to fiction because it intrigues me in your brief bio yep. that you are a, a playwright yep. who is sidelining. Yes. Say sideline to, in a in a dismissive way, yeah. but ex very successfully sidelining in fiction. Well, I now, how, how did, tell me about that. How process. that happened? Um, you know, I've written in every dramatic medium that there is: plays, musicals, operas, radio plays, um, screenplays, teleplays, and. Um, I won this amazing award for one of my musicals, which gave me two years of writing time. And 
I thought it was really odd when they gave me this lovely award that my first thought was not, oh, yay, I can't wait to write my next musical. I didn't think that at all. And I realized I'd never been given a gift like this before, and I was not likely to be given another gift. So what did I really want to do? So I spent some time thinking about it's that. It's a tough question. It's a tough question. And I realized that what I most wanted was to be a beginner again by doing something I didn't know how to do and thereby reconnect to the creative process. One of the problems, and it's not a big problem, but one of the issues of becoming a professional writer is that you come to the table with a whole host of both expectations and considerations about whether you can sell tickets, whether it has too many characters in it, is this gonna be a commercial idea, that are not really about the fun of the creative process. They're yeah. about being smart about the business side of things. Um, yeah, whether the producer's gonna complain about the sets. Exactly, yeah. you know, are you asking for too much? Yeah. Does anybody care? Um, so it was, I think I was really looking for a kind of artistic freedom that I'd had earlier um, when you're, you know, younger and no less. Um, and I thought, what the heck, let's go into a whole other medium and a whole mm -hmm. other world um, of fiction. And I also had an idea at that point for something that I was like, I, you know, maybe that could be a book, I thought. I had no idea I was going to succeed. I had. This was before Alice Bliss. This was Alice Bliss. I had no idea I would, you know, it would hold up as a novel. I had no idea that I could, you know, really do what I was setting out to do. It was, it was like being a scientist and saying, let's experiment. And if it fails, it fails, and I'll learn something from it. And if it succeeds, I'll learn something from it. Um, and let's, let's see what it's like. And it was a lot of fun. And a very successful and wonderful book. Thank you. Now, lucky for us, you didn't decide to go to something new again. You decided <laughs> to return to fiction yep. for Catalog of Birds. Yep. Tell us something about the conception. I'm going to hold this up. We're going to, it's a wonderful book. I'm going to plug the daylights out of it. Catalog of Birds, <laughs> published in spring of 17? Summer. 17, summer of 17 yeah. this year, and uh, set in, as you mentioned, upstate New York yep. among an Irish American family. Uh, when did you get the idea for this? Um, shortly after finishing Alice Bliss, um, I knew I wanted to write another book, and I was, as we all do, kind of floating around looking for my next obsession. Um, and a close friend of mine gave me this tiny little book called um, The Hidden History of the Natural World. Um, of Wolves and Honey was the first title, A Hidden History of the Nat Natural World is its subtitle. And it was a memoir set in Geneva, New York on Seneca Lake about a brother and a sister. Ooh. And it was... And you had not heard about this book. I had not heard, I had never heard about this book. I had never been to Geneva. I had never been to Seneca Lake. In spite of growing up 60 miles from it, my family went to Maine or they went to Lake Ontario. We did not go to Seneca Lake. So the whole region was a... a revelation to me and the history of the region was fascinating to me because of the Native American history, the history of birds, the history of apples. All um, of which are important. Very important. Uh, in the uh, catalog of birds. Um, and we're so close to Cornell which is on Cayuga Lake and the Cornell Ornithology Station where um, and, and Rachel Carson spent some time in Ithaca at Cornell uh, while she was writing A Silent Spring, which is a huge inspiration for this book. Um, and that's sort of where it began. And then I also was thinking about and so troubled by, continued to be troubled by, the fact that we are, in, at this point we're 16 years into a forever war that we're not paying attention to. Uh, because most of us have the luxury not to be able mm. to f just forget about it, and that we're losing something like 23 soldiers a day to suicide. Every day. That's, I, All year I long. knew that it was a, a substantial. I didn't know it was that. But tw will you say that again? 23 please? soldiers a day. Uh, to suicide. To suicide. Um, it's almost one in an hour. Um, and um, that just haunted me. 
And I started to think about, how, okay, you know, these are political ideas and things that are disturbing me. How am I going to craft a story about this? So um, I decided to write about a bird artist whose fondest dream is to fly, and so he enlists in Vietnam as a helicopter pilot. And I was also interested after Alice Bliss, which dealt with the Iraq War and the family left behind and at home, um, I was interested in what happens when a soldier comes home. Um, severely you're dealing with older, uh, older, older characters, characters yeah. and severely hurt. Um, and also interested in the parallels between, and stop me any time here, John. Um, no, 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 between you're the, here for the Between time. the Seneca Sorry. Indians and our, not just the Seneca, but all Native Americans, which we have such an ugly history with, and the way that we um, refer to, at the time, referred to the Vietnamese as other in order to be able to murder them. Um, and the additional way in which war is the greatest polluter the world has ever invented, and what we did with chemicals, and it's, it's hundreds of thousands of tons of chemicals that we dropped on Vietnam. And then those chemicals are repurposed by the chemical companies and come home for domestic use um, in applications such as Roundup, which is of course now being banned. Um, it only took us 50 or something mm -hmm. yeah. years. Billy is very aware of that. The, oh, uh, because he's carrying, not only is he physically hurt, he's carrying some of the damage from that yeah, chemical use. Yeah. I want to say those themes, the wonderful themes, are all important in the book. Mm -hmm. The book, even with that intellectual load, moves wonderfully. Good. And... Uh, <laughs> It doesn't doesn't stop from I think what the first paragraph is mm. the tree accident, yep. and uh, then there's a disappearance, a, a pregnancy, a, all kinds of, and that's that's all early. Yep, very that's early. probably in the first fifteen pages. Th those those, <laughs> those mysteries are uh, evolve yep. through uh, a really nicely crafted plot. Mm. Uh, I see the dramatist background. Thank um, you. But the themes are there, yeah. they're, and they're but they're they're not hammered in. They're they're they they evolve organically, emerge organically from the, from the book. I'm I very, really, I'm glad to hear you say that. That was what the hard work of the book was: is to let the characters carry because that's what we care about carry the book and to have those themes be percolating underneath. Yeah, they they indeed they do. Yeah. Um, I, I'm dying to ask because I hinted at this earlier. Does your dramatic history, uh, uh, your your background as a playwright, which is extensive, inform you when you're working in fiction? Um, I think I, I I think it's been a huge help to me. My opinion. I hope my readers feel the same. Um, but it it it. I think I organize a story through scenes. Um, and I organize a story through the character's actions. Um, and uh, that helps propel, that has a kind of energy. I like to think of the energy of the book and the velocity of the book and the velocity of the story so that it does That's something good word. Good, to the reader, word. which you know pulls you through. Um, and I think that's totally from the theater, where you can't bore someone in the theater for, in the theater I can't say, well, that was kind of a long sentence, I'll just put this down and go get a cup of coffee and come back. If anybody sitting in a theater seat feels that way, they've left. Yeah. They, or, or if that's happening in your play, it never gets produced. So mm -hmm. there's very little margin of yeah. error in terms of holding the audience's attention in the theater, and that's a good training that's a, that's ground. A good, that's a good lesson. I, I just recalled a, a, a Stephen King line about Elmore Leonard. Yeah. He said uh, his books are so exciting, they're kind of, if you want to get up and get a cookie, you take the book <laughs> so you don't miss anything. Uh, okay. And I think that, that you have that quality here. Oh, and, good. And I, think, I think that's good. It's certainly true of theater. Yes. Uh, I. I was surprised at the direction of theater to fiction because mm -hmm. I see it often fiction to theater yep. and people have a lot of trouble because in fiction you can imagine uh, a $500 million set budget yep. or, you're, or you're picturing movies with yep. a $50 million budget and then you go into a theater and you, you've got no, no, <laughs> right. no, no budget. Wings, well, wing <laughs> space, you know, and right. uh, no room for anything and no budget and it doesn't work. 
Do you have trouble going back and forth because of that? Or are you, um, so, you by now you're so disciplined and think so. You know, if I'm writing for the theater, I'm still, you know, thinking in that very particular way. Um, I'm not doing much writing for the theater anymore. I am working on one great big musical, um, but that's it at the moment. I'm really focused on um, fiction. And what is the musical? Is that the Alice? No, Alice Bliss, Bliss the musical is carrying on without me, um, which is a good thing. Um, and we unfortunately had a very ill composer. And as that project took longer than expected, I realized that I was really finished with that beautiful book um, and that I should be moving on to other things. Um, and they've replaced me with a wonderful playwright named Karen Hartman, and they've got a big workshop coming up in January at um, Goodspeed Opera House in Connecticut. So it's in wonderful hands. Playwrights Horizons is continuing to that? support. I'm very happy because I think it's going to have its own life without me. Um, and I'm it, pleased about that. Is that difficult artistically to separate? Sometimes and, and know that it, was a, you, it was a difficult decision because I love my collaborators and we have a fantastic director involved. And as I was letting people know that I decided to leave the project, the director said to me, this is my number one project. And I thought, wow, if I were ever going to be seduced back <laughs> into this, those would be the right words. But I was like, I, I just felt like going backwards every time I went back to work on uh, the musical. Um, so the musical I am working on is called The Perfect 36, and it's about the ratification of the 19th Amendment, which gave women the right to vote. Um, we created this in 1996 for um, Tennessee. It was Tennessee's bicentennial. We were the cultural centerpiece of their celebration. Um, because Tennessee was the 36th and final state to ratify. So in a very hot August in 1920, all of the national players descended on Nashville, Tennessee to battle out the final state. And we won the vote by one vote, one man changing his mind. Um, and we're bringing it back, we did it in 1996, we're bringing it back for 2020, the 100th anniversary of getting the right to vote, and hoping that we will, um, the plan at the moment is to do a four city tour in Tennessee, and then see if we can carry on. Wonderful, wonderful. When you mentioned that you were in the first co-ed class yep. at Bowdoin, yep. I thought it's amazing that people around our age who can remember those first, and there's still a few women left uh, who were alive in 1920 who yep. might, you know, well, certainly there was some, they'd be very, children. very old. Their but, children, perhaps, but, but, but yes. But there are a few women alive who, uh, who, who existed in 1920, yep. and that's... Well, and it took um, 72 years and 800 legislative campaigns to win the vote. 800. So when you think about what it takes to create change, it's pretty. It's just a wonderful story. So there might be hope for guns. <laughs> yes, Maybe. I hope so. I hope uh, so. I want to make sure I get back to this book. Yeah, yeah. And I'm going to hold it up again. <laughs> Catalog of Birds. This is about the Flynn family. Yep. Uh, and, and others. Uh, the um, Alsops, yep, Alsops and, and others. Uh, can you tell us, without giving away any spoilers, what happens in the book? And I, I don't want to say anything about. I'm not yeah, going to say any spoilers. I, 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 just I can't wanna... tell you too much, but I can tell you that Billy comes home um, after having. Uh, as the only survivor of a helicopter crash mm -hmm. and uh, comes home. First, he goes to a hospital ship uh, where they stabilize him. He comes home to a VA hospital, which is a horror. Um, and then his family um, basically sp nearly spends themselves into bankruptcy to move him into a private hospital and get him the care that he needs. When he comes home, the family rallies around to bring him back. But Billy's losses, which include um, burns, uh, um, as well as loss of hearing, loss of taste, loss of smell, means that the thing he loves more than anything, which is the outdoors um, and the natural world, he's, pretty, he's feeling very cut off from it because of the way that his senses have been impacted. And he was a brilliant bird artist, um, and he can't use his right hand. And in trying to learn to use his left hand, 
he's experiencing a great deal of difficulty and frustration. Um, and so his family sets out to do what families do, which is to help him and to save him. Um, and in the meantime, his uh, childhood love, a girl named Megan Alsop, disappears the day after he gets home from Vietnam under very mysterious circumstances. And his sister Nell, who he is so close to, um, is the person who is most involved in being with him and trying to um, bring him back, really, um, through hiking, canoeing, listening to birds. Um, I want to say the, 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 much of this comes as a, a character surprise because the very beginning of the book, she falls out mm -hmm. of a tree, right. which is wonderful, wonderfully symbolic. She falls out, so you think, well, it's the big brother's going to take care of the girl, yep. the little sister, for the rest of the book, and it's the reverse. not quite that way. Yep, yep. Um, and then it's the story of a big family um, and all of the things that are going on with this family. And I think one of the other uh, pieces of the story that I find interesting is Nell's conflict. Nell is the younger sister whether with Billy Hurt and her family having financial troubles, and she's just graduating from high school and gets a scholarship to Cornell, she wants to be a scientist, will she be able to launch and surpass her brother? What does that feel like? Can you leave your hurting brother behind, in a sense? Um, so that's one of the interesting uh, parts of the story for me. And there's a love story with uh, Billy's best friend, uh, um. Harlow, Harlow Murphy. Um, part Indian, part Irish, um, and there's a love story with the, with the place. Um, this family is deeply, deeply embedded in the natural world. The father is a pomologist. He studies and um, creates apples for the Cornell Agricultural Station, and that land exists on the land that was um, taken from the Seneca Indians. Um, interestingly, I have just a few of my mother's books. And um, one of the books I have is The Apples of New York State. And it was published in the 1880s. And there were so many varieties of apples in New York State. It's two volumes, and each one is the size of a phone book. And as I'm flipping through that book, as I'm working on a catalog of birds, I come across a picture of a stump of one of the Seneca Indian trees, which were destroyed by um, Sullivan's army as they marched north. And there's a green shoot growing out of it, which, again, was one of the things that the father is working on bringing those so, apples back. We eat only about three kinds of apples, I think, in, 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 out of supermarkets. That's out, right. Out of the hundreds. Well, uh, I want to make sure I watch the time because I wanted to ask you if you could pick a paragraph yes. or two from the book that you feel and read for us that you feel might reflect its, its tone. One I, or two I, paragraphs, huh? Well, okay. you happen to have a couple. I can do it. Let's see. Let's find two paragraphs here. So Nell has just discovered that she's gotten into Cornell, and she goes up to her brother's room to tell him. And she opens the door, and he's not there. And... All of his drawings, uh, there's a cork board along one whole wall in Billy's room, all of the drawings are gone. Um, and the paintings, there are a few paintings that are, are hung there, and they're also gone. And she's trying to figure out what has happened, and she goes to the window and looks outside. Um, I can just, let's see. In a panic, she searches the floor under the bed, thinking something can be salvaged. She inventories the paintings she has in her possession, the great horned <coughs> owl in her room, the eastern Phoebe inside her closet door, the morning doves in her locker at school, the small canvas at the piano downstairs. She turns to the wall beside Billy's bed. The heron is gone. And then she smells smoke. Pushing the curtains open, she looks out to the side yard. Billy stands with his back to her, a trash barrel burning in front of him, feeding his drawings and paintings into the fire. She sees the grackle's shiny blue-black feathers facing away from the viewer, looking over its shoulder, consumed in the flames. Feels the caption Billy had written rising up in her. 
had I but hands to put around your throat. She lifts a hand to knock at the window, yell through the glass, knows it's too late. His hands are nearly empty, the fire blazing. He looks over his shoulder, up to the window, sensing her presence, unconsciously, unconsciously mimicking the bird. His eyes are blank. Very nice. Uh, the, the birds, um, of course, it's in the title, but there are wonderful descriptions of birds in different places, how the birds uh, indicate if there's a predator around, mm -hmm. or there's a wonderful description of two eagles locking talons mm -hmm. and kind of falling. I've seen that on television. I've never seen it live. Um, <coughs> excuse me. It made me want to visit upstate New York, uh, which I've drawn, driven through many, many times, but never stopped, really. I think yeah. once in Schenectady overnight. Yeah. <laughs> but it's, um, what would you tell other perspective, other writers, perspective writers, viewers, who are thinking about writing as, you know, go-to practical advice about how to go about it? It's a great question. Um, <clears throat> one of the things I tell my students, there are a couple of things I tell them. One, on the first day of class, I ask them to post a little sign on their computer, which is, trust your instincts and be kind to yourself. Because as beginners, we can knock ourselves down all the time, and it's really important to be kind enough so that you keep coming back to the practice. And the second is that we have this idea that inspiration, it's a very romantic idea, that it shows up kind of mysteriously, and it's a beautiful woman, and blah, blah, blah. Um, and so we spend a lot of time waiting around for inspiration. And I think the much better way to model our lives is on musicians who show up at the piano to practice whether they feel like it or not. Um, and Absolutely. that writing is a practice. Um, I think it's also kind of a faith-based practice. You don't know what you're doing <laughs> or where you're going, but you show up anyways. Um, and creating that practice will give you the opportunity to find out what you are thinking, what you want to write agree. about. Uh, Tim O'Brien, with whom I've spoken often in the past, huh. talked about putting in butt time. Mm -hmm. And he meant being in the chair no matter what. Your butt's there, whether your brain's in there or not, you be there. I've, someone else created the acronym BIC. Here's all I need to tell you, BIC, butt in chair. <laughs> <laughs> That's good advice. That's good advice. We are almost finished. I'm going to uh, finish by showing the book again. I want to highly recommend this. It's a wonderful novel by the well-known playwright, uh, Laura Harrington, who has uh, switched to novels. Are you ever going back to playwriting? You never know. Who knows? It's you know, answer. every story has its own form, I think. So it kind of depends on what, how it shows up. Thank you very much for coming back to the Writer's Block, Laura Harrington. Thank you, John. It's lovely to be here. I want to thank you out there in uh, cable TV land for being with us as well. If you've learned something about Laura Harrington's wonderful new novel, A Catalog of Birds, then the Writer's Block has done its job. Thanks for being with us, and I hope to see you again next week on the Writer's Block. Good night. <laughs>